Baker is where the little Higgs is found, the little H, and that's the guy who looks like the standard model. So here's basically the summary of the situation. Of the five, at least one of them will be found over the entire MA tangent Baker plane. If Susie is there, at least one of them is found. The full exploration of the plane, as we saw yesterday, actually demands the very highest integrated luminosities in order to cope with a scenario where there's maximal stock mixing. And then there's this difficult region that I just alluded to. And the thing to remember is that in this intermediate tangent beta region, in other words, here in the little green, is where the, it's going to be difficult to disentangle the standard model and the MSSM case, because only the little one is actually detectable. And then, caveats to this picture, there's going to be the other scenario where the Higgs, is, where the Susie scale is not above the Higgs, and therefore now you allow interdecays. So for example, here is one possible cascade. You start with a Duino, which is at one TV, uh, sorry, a spork, then that gives you a Duino at 900, gives you the fourth neutralino, it goes to a Chargino 2, that go, or uh, potentially also goes to a, a Chi 3 0 directly, and then you skip the Higgses. Somewhere in this decay chain, Chi 3 to Chi 2, you get uh, these Higgses, and then eventually you cascade down. Now, you, clearly, the signature at this point is completely different than the case where all of these guys are above the masses of the Higgses. What that translates to now is that there are two types of new signatures. One is where the Higgses go to Charginos and Neutralinos. And what that means is that, again, you have to cope with, first of all, this lightest guy here, which is, if you assume that he is missing because of our parity conservation, then that becomes missing ET. And then from those guys, you'll have either missing neutrinos or the neutrinos that come from the smutrino decays. And correspondingly, the leptons that you've always used in order to have some chance to cope with the background. The signatures, in some cases, in some cases, if you take you know, very hard cups, like at least five jets, one of them to be at least 300 GeV, uh, very large missing ET, and you lo you're looking at the highest um, total ET events with something like one TeV or more, and in addition we demand B tagging, here is a, a genuinely uh, a random point, this has not been selected because it, it looks so good, yellow is basically the total signature that one would have from the Higgs, and interestingly enough, the red is the rest of the Susie background. In fact, in these cascade scenarios, to tell you the truth, it will be very difficult to understand in the early days what is being done. And the reason is that standard model is this little green thing here. The signatures are actually quite clean. There's multi-leptons, there's lots of missing energy, and so on and so on and so on. The events are more spectacular. But the problem is, is that this red is a Susie background to the Higgs Susie itself. And this actually is a feature that repeats itself again and again. So until there's going to be some kind of, of synthesis of, 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 of early signals on what it is that we're looking at, and in particular in the absence of spin measurements, because we will not know whether this little H that was found is spin zero or something else, and therefore we will not know where, what to assign it to, um, the situation will be quite interesting. What was the horizontal axis? <coughs> this thing here? Yeah. This is a BD bar invariant mass. This is 100 GV, 150 GV, 200 GV. And this is for the case of a little peak, which is around 100 or 110. Um, it's a very broad peak because it's a BD bar <coughs> digest. So. And then the other scenario whereby you have this type of cascade is that these guys are right below the little Higgs, for example, it's below these and above, say, the Chi 1, Chi 1, but it's twice the mass, in which case it can be K to two of them, and that is what I refer to as the, uh, the, com the invisible Higgs scenario, whereby the decay just goes to Chi 1, Chi 1, and we saw yesterday that it will be pretty difficult to convince oneself that the missing energy axis, which is large, is because there is somebody new who is created and decays to two new other particles that we have never detected. <coughs> that's, what, that's what's tricky about it. Huh? 
If one takes all of these cascades as we understand them today and goes back to this plane, uh, these are the tau modes. I remind you that the bosonic modes that were coming from the right of the plane this way, these all essentially are probable with BB bar decays, and they come in and they close the plane from the left. And essentially, independent of the mass of tangent beta, you probe uh, up to about 200 GV in the mass of decay. This type of decay, usually, this type of, of scenario, is usually looked at in the grander context of the SUSY particle surges themselves. Because in this case, the Higgs surge is really very intimately uh, connected to the SUSY particle surges. In particular, if one now looks at Spork and Duinos and the production and so on, the first thing that's really shocking is the fact that these guys really have high cross-sections because they're strongly interacting. So if we take it up at half a TV, which is roughly, say, where the Tevatron will leave us, uh, the cross-section is 100 picobarns, which translates to a million or 10 million events a year. This is going to be a SUSY factory if SUSY is there at a the low mass scale. This is also um, the, given that uh, uh, much of this is S-channel S production. Well, it's just the usual QQ bar, except that now it's spork, anti-spork production and so on, or the Duino one. The mean PT is roughly half the mass of the object. So in this case, with a 500 GV guy, this is a PT distribution. The mean is around 250 or 300 GV. So not only are they massive, but they also are quite boosted, and therefore it means that the decay products will have a lot of transverse momentum. As in the plane, now, uh, this is M sugra, more on this in just a moment, of M0 and M1 half. This is the uh, presumed common mass of all the scalars at some very, very high energy scale. This is the same thing for all the spin one half particles. These are the cross sections, and basically, if you look at the where you have about at 14 TV, you have 0.1 femtobarns, which is roughly what you would expect from the statistics that you would get from the design luminosity. That in itself tells you that you can probe masses up to 2 TV. So, uh, roughly, masses of 2 TV is what the ultimate limit of the LHD will be. Now, what happens when you produce a spork of the Gluino? Well, a very impressive cascade follows. I've sketched two different ones here. This is a scenario where the Gluino goes then into a spork and an anti-quark. The Q bars are no longer put there because of the tilde and the bar and so on, it becomes really messy. Then you have the spork that decays the equivalent of weekly, except that now it will go to a chargino which could be mostly vino, depending on where you are in the space, and then a quark, and then this W eno, the vino, or some linear combination to make a chargino would then go into an electron and neutrino, and the ever present, the ever present light of supersymmetric particle, which can be stable or not stable depending on whether the assumes are parity or not. These cascades, of course, are extremely rich. The branches that one can take are many, um, and the space. <laughs> really lends itself to a lot of publications, as you will see shortly. Now, there are two generic options, basically, when you get down to the very bottom of the chain, and on the other side you have a, a quark with a, a chi-2, and the chi-2 goes to two leptons in the chi-1. In one case is where the, inter the Higgs can appear in the decay between the chi-2 going to chi-1. This is the very, very end of the chain. And the other one is where this is not there, and therefore the only thing that you have left is to go to a dilemma. And this lends itself to two generic signatures which have been studied a lot. This one is basically you look for a dilepton, and because of the mass difference, the dilepton will have some mass distribution and then a very sharp cutoff corresponding to the mass difference between the chi 2 and the chi 1. And the other one, well, the other one is a simultaneous discovery of the little h that will go into BB bar, of course, because this is a low mass Higgs plus the rest of Susan. So, the options are to look for Higgs to BB bar or for isolated multi -lepons. Now, in general, these events will be characterized by many hardships, a lot, a lot of missing energy. Uh, in particular, we have two lightest supersymmetric particles. We also have additional neutrinos that come in either directly from, from neutrinos directly produced or from neutrinos that come from neutrino decay. 
And you also have many lemons. They are, in a few words, very spectacular events. They really will not look like the typical event. Here's an example from a, a stop uh, simulation. And these, what you observe here is five B jets. Uh, sorry, four B jets and an additional fifth jet. These are events which are by far are very, very, uh, uh, they, they stand out. Now suppose you turn on, and Susie is there at some low mass scale. What does one see? What is the first early warning? If one looks at events with a lot of jets and missing ET, and forms the sum of the transverse momenta of the jets plus the missing ET, and forms what we call an effective mass, and you go to the highest possible scales, this is 1 TV, 2 TV, 3 TV, this is what you'd expect from the standard model, and this is the SUSE additional contribution. Now what's nice about this is that this quantity here tracks effectively mass SUSE, in other words, the mass of the particles, quite well, of course it's not equal, this is an effective mass, this is mass SUSE, this is 500 GV, correspondingly here you have 1 TeV, so there's a factor 2, but this tracking here is pretty good, as you see, for different scenarii, and you basically get a 20% measurement of where the SUSE scale is, just from this. Now this was a picture actually about eight years ago. This is what happened recently with uh, the more detailed calculations, and this is, for example, the difference between Pythia and Alchem. What you see on the right-hand side is the old estimate that comes from the Atlas TDR, and the hashed line here corresponds the total standard model background calculation, which is the multi jets and the missing ET, and the point is, again, what you have from SUSE. This is what the situation is now with Alchem. This came out of Pythia. This is the same calculation out of uh, Alchem, and basically what you the SUSE points are essentially the same, except they're no longer points, it's this uh, uh, black histogram here, but the background has moved up. And in fact, when this first appeared, we got pretty scared, because if now you're trying to see the difference between the hashed histogram or the dark histogram, you're in trouble. Because you're now looking over some kind of shoulder that's reminiscent of the uh, uh, J side shoulder in the experiment that did not see it. Now, <coughs> to proceed beyond this basic <laughs> measurement, <laughs> you need you need help because you can't possibly start running the Monte Carlo over all the possible combinations. And uh, so you need to you need to use a model. There's no way out. Um, the MSSM itself if we were complaining about the 19 or 26 parameters of the standard model, contains 124 parameters. And even in this scenario, even the standard uh, with the space which is so large, uh, you can either look at it as, as, as uh, uh, you know, work insurance, or you can look at it as your loss and you don't know where to go. So we have minimal supergravity, GMSB, which is gauge mediated symmetry breaking, and anomaly mediated symmetry breaking as the three typical models which are used. And what distinguishes, what sets them apart is basically what actually breaks SUSE itself. It's obvious that SUSE also has to be a broken symmetry, simply because the supersymmetric particles are presumably at 1 TV, the standard model we know is much lower. So somebody breaks it. We don't know who breaks it. Just like yesterday, in extended technical, or somebody has to break it to give mass to that and the technical of both of them. And therefore, we have to use these models that make simplifying assumptions. If you take SUGRA, which is actually uh, uh, popular, I don't know by, by what historic uh, reasons, there are, you boil it down to just five parameters. Well, one is the scalar, every, all scalars have the same mass M0 at the gut scale, or the genos have the same mass at the gut scale. You always have tangent beta because you always need the, at least the two doublets to run for the symmetry breaking. The sign of the, inter of the uh, coupling uh, term between the hitches. And then you have the trilinear coupling A0 at the, always at the gut scale. You start at an extremely <coughs> large scale and you solve everything backwards. There's 26 renormalization group equations. And you end up with something like this, whereby this is now log lambda. This is 16, this is M0, this is M1 half. This is how you evolve 
the guino, the vino, the bino. The bino is the equivalent B of the, what then becomes the linear combination of the the photon and so on. And then M0 here is what becomes the sports and the select cons and so on. The amazing thing here is first of all, that you actually, because of the, the RGE, what you have is basically two parameters and then you end up with a, with a whole spectrum. It looks like a maximally predictive uh, uh, power for the theory. The other nice thing is that if you look at what happens to the Higgs field, well, the symmetry breaking is driven basically by the fact that the evolution comes down and creates a negative m squared for one of them. So what you have is a natural appearance of symmetry breaking in Sousa. You get mu squared less than zero simply as an artifact, artifact as a result of the evolution. For this reason, when you now start populating space, and this is m1 half, this is m0, and these are contours of the various quark and slepton masses and so on and so on, the region that we consider to be allowed in the case of Sugra scenario is the one which is non-shaded, and these chunks of space here, depending on where you are in mu greater than zero, in tangent beta and so on, are the ones in which this natural symmetry breaking occurs, where naturally mu squared goes to less than zero. And that's what we mean when we say theoretically disallowed. The other part which is disallowed is where the lightest supersymmetric particle is not the neutralino, <laughs> but it's the tau. And that would be bad because then the LSP would be a charged particle and that would make for a very different universe. So if we want that the LSP, if it's really there to be neutral, plus to have natural symmetry breaking, you have to confine yourself in the region between the two. So how do we proceed? So we cut out light as tau 1 LSP. This is mass 1 half, this is mass 0. The yellow now is, is chunk because the, the scale has come down to where the LHC will be relevant. This is 2 TV, this is 1.5 TV. And then in this plane is where you have to look for things. Now, the, the fact that the mass of the Higgs is greater than 114 T, GV has cut out this white space here. And now you look at the rest of the plane and you identify the different areas where the signature, what we're going to see, is going to be different. So, for example, here, in this particular area, is where the chi 2 decay to selecton lepton, and then the selecton goes into lepton, so therefore you end up with the infamous dilepton, is dominant. This region here, instead, is the region where it goes to a Higgs, and so on. So you try to systematize over large chunks of space what the different signature is going to be. And then you start. Well, first one, it's the inclusive search. And the inclusive search, what you do is, back to the uh, original analysis that I showed you, which was jets and missing ET and so on, what is the way out for the fact that the backgrounds are now higher? Well, you basically, beyond the fact that you're demanding a lot of missing ET and the corresponding cleanup that, that we've learned from the Tevatron, there's all sorts of requirements for being able and so on. <coughs> Lots of jets, indirect lepton veto, that actually helps. And then cuts on the angle between the jets and the missing ET. That also serves as cleanup, and that does bring up the significance again. And if you look at where the backgrounds are coming from, it's basically always TT bar and Z to neutrinos plus jets. These two are always the two big backgrounds. The collection of all the other diboson decays and so on and so on usually barely arrives to the same level as the Z. So this Z to neutrinos plus jets is one irreducible background which is always there. And it's a background also in the case of extra dimension searches with missing ET as we will see later in the talk. With this, if one wants to use an inclusive sample in order to discover things, because of this large difference, which is the dark points is SUSY, this is a standard model background following the topological cuts. This becomes again an early discovery signal. So this will be the warning that there is something. Now, of course, if all you know that you have is missing ET and lots of jets, there's lots of things that can give you that, including is it Susie, is it universal extra dimensions, is it this, is it that. This will not be enough, but this will be an exciting time, because that will launch the process of what extra do you look for. Here is a scenario where now you look for dileptons. A prototype decay for this is basically the chi 2 that goes to the chi 1 and lepton lepton. Here's the invariant mass of same flavor lepton, so electrons and muons added together, subtracting 
the electron-muon combinations. This way you take out all the backgrounds, including the big one, which is TT bar. So the blue line here, which hovers up and down around zero, it hovers that way because of the incomplete statistical subtraction of the standard model background. And then what you have now is the remaining signal, which is basically the chi-1 EE and the chi-1 mu mu. Same flavors for the two leptons. And what you see is a very sharp edge. You have an accumulation of events. Actually, the fact that this rises linearly is a direct consequence of the spin of this guy. But then you have a sharp edge corresponding to the mass difference between the two. And this is going to be one of the biggest signals for the fact that one is dealing now with some kind of decay that involves these particles here. The cuts are always high for jets and missing ET, and it's the dielectrons that make the difference. For, depending on where you are in phase space, you could even have an accumulation of something like 800 events with only one inverse of So 2008 would be the year to look for some, to, to see something like this already, the first year of operation. The position of the edge, I should also say, is very accurate. And depending on where we are, this may lead to a very accurate measurement of some of the Susan parameters. What would you do next? Well, you would want to know, am I looking at a two-body decay or is this a three-body decay? Is it uh, that uh, this chi-1 and the missing energy that I'm observing is coming out of somebody else or is it coming directly out of here? And is this decay fundamentally a slept-on lepton and the slept-on decays to these two or a direct decay into three bodies? How do you handle that? You play the usual tricks like, for example, from tau decays. You plot the pt max and pt min, the asymmetry of the two leptons, and depending, this is, the, this is the asymmetry from 0 to 1. The red line is what you have out of two body decays. The blue line is what you have out of three body decays. And now, little by little, you start disentangling what it is that, that has created the signal. But of course, the sharp edge is the one possibility. You could be now further down in the plane where you can go both into the neutralino, but you could go with the two leptons, or if uh, the mass difference between the chi-2 and the chi-1 allows a decay to a z, you'd have the previous uh, distribution and an additional z peak, and this is just a different point in Suez. So this is now actually the simultaneous observation of three new things. I repeat, it's going to be interesting how to disentangle. So finally, what is the reach for, for, for this kind of search? What you have here in the various lines is the different signatures that can be utilized. So for example, this dot dashed curve is basically the reach of the same sign to muon search. The purple curve that you see here is jets and missing ET and muons. And then finally, this is the inclusive search. This is an M1 half, this is 700, this thing here is 1400. This is the disallowed, the yellow and the blue. And this part is what will be covered for sure in the first year of operation. This more than doubles, actually, uh, it more than triples, I should say, the corresponding uh, reach from the current experiment. The catch is that the real reach, the highest reach, is gotten from this uh, inclusive signature, the Jetson missing ET. But that's the one where you don't really know much else. You just know something is there. If you now start narrowing down, of course, the more you narrow it down, go, 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 and then eventually you look at the line of MH equals 114 GV, the reach, of course, decreases. If you are to run it on the ultimate LHC luminosity and you see where you get, it's basically the same plot, except that now the ultimate reach extends from the 1 to the 2 TV, which basically says that essentially the reach of the LHC as conceived is 2 TeV in the M0, M1 half plane. Now you start asking yourself, these are beautiful signatures. What happens if I vary tangent beta? Well, what happens if you vary tangent beta is that those decays into leptons bring up the third generation, which is heavier, and therefore the decays <coughs> would go into taps. This is again the dilepton edge. This is mass lepton lepton. And this is the EE to mu mu. It's on a log plot now, which is why it looks a little weird. These are the backgrounds. This is, for example, the E mu that gets subtracted. So after the peak, there is nothing surviving. And what happens now is that we start changing tangent beta from a low value of 2. It goes to 10, 
to 15 to 25. And what you see is that the EE component is disappearing. It's becoming lower and lower. And what is coming out instead is the surviving tau, essentially, component, plus the fact that the, the Z comes in. So when, you have, when you're looking at very large tangent beta values, it's the same basic signature, except that now you're looking at two tau leptons. And of course, that does make life harder, because tau is decay hadronically, as you know. Well, they also decay the tonic, but they, they, you no longer have the full lepton at your disposal. So this is one big scenario. The other big one is where the cascade, Gluino to Sport to Chi2, and then you get to the Chi2, and at this point, you do not go to leptons, but you can go into the little H plus X1. This guy gives you the missing ET. This is a little H goes to BB bar. So what you look for is basically a BB bar resonance. So this is the invariant mass of the BB bar pairs. This is again where it gets tricky. The blue, this little chicken smear here, is basically the standard model. Everything else is SUSY, except that this broad thing is all the SUSY particles, the Bs that are produced in these cascades from bottom decays that give you bottoms and so on and so on, plus this little thing here, which actually corresponds to this signal. So in fact, it's interesting that in this scenario, SUSY is actually the biggest background to itself. And this entangling it is going to be interesting. Which part of the planes you cover back to this infamous <coughs> plot before we were covering the edges on this side and on that side with the dileptons, whether the EE e and mu mu and tau tau. And in the central area is where you get the reach, depending on how much luminosity you have out of the Higgs decay. At the end, there's been a lot of studies over uh, benchmark points and selecting them on the basis of signatures and so on. Um, the the, the uh, literature is full of, of phenomenology papers. This is uh, one particular summary from uh, uh, each one of these is, a, is an initial of a name. So a lot of people have worked on it. And this is again the M0, M1 half point. And the blue is basically what you would call the allowed region in the M supra plane if you take into account the W map measurement. In other words, if you use all the cosmological constraints. And um, the different regions correspond to different accidents. For example, this, this little line here corresponds to the accident of the masses of the 2 chi 1 being precisely equal to half of the mass of a boson, at which point you have a rapid uh, annihilation of the, of the two, and so on and so on. The relevant part is here. You can argue that this is what the LHC will, will cover, and that uh, these potential avenues which are, I don't know if one calls them freak scenarios or, or accidents, or you wanted to philosophize more and call them uh, part of the anthropologic principle or whatever, where in fact Susie could escape at the highest masses. That could be the case, but of course, one would run into problems with a naturalness argument, which is the fact that if Susie is there because it's going to act as the Higgs stabilizer, then it better be that the mass scale is roughly around 1 TV. By the time you start running to 5 and 10 TV, you no longer have the infamous cancellation of the self coupling um, This is really a cartoon. Depending on where you are in these points, which have been thrown around, what you have here is the number of points of, of particles that one will observe. So the, the light blue are the Higgses, the big blue are the the charginos and neutralinos, red is leptons, and green is always the squarks. And this is supposed to show you the, the score. This is the total, of course, and then this is how many you discover, and there's points like M and H, in other words, right here at the edges, where the only guy you can see is a one little H. Remember, the experiments were designed to see this one little H, so it's always there. Except, you'll see it, nothing else, and you'll have no idea whether it's an extension or it's a standard model Suppose you did see something and you saw a combination of things. Well, depending on which point you are in space, you could actually go back and play the game of saying, what are the original parameters if I am in a Sugra scenario? There will be a lot of papers of this type. The answer is it really depends on where you are, the precision with which you can actually extract the fundamental parameters. In some cases, always we're talking at very, very large luminosities. In, one, in some cases, you can get a, a, a 
an indirect measure of M0 with a precision of about 25%. In some other points, you're, you're very lucky and you can get a 4% measurement of things. So it really, really depends on, on where you are in physics. The other big scenario is gauge-mediated symmetry break. Now this one assumes that uh, SUSY is broken actually in a sector that contains heavy particles which are really have nothing to do with the, with the standard model. And the two worlds communicate with each other via so-called messengers. So the advantage of, of this model is that the mass comes straight out of gauge interactions. It's a gauge coupling that produces a mass. And therefore, you avoid directly flavor changing neutral currents, which is why the proponents of this type of, of, of model say that uh, uh, this is a big advantage against super. One of the, the, one of the weaknesses of supergravity is that you have flavor changing neutral currents coming out of the wazoo, and then you need to protect yourself against them using various technicalities. The interesting thing here is that the lightest supersymmetric partner is actually the gravitino now. In Sugra, the Gravitino is a very heavy guy and is phenomenologically irrelevant, doesn't appear anywhere. On the other hand, here in GMSB, the next to lighter supersymmetric particle decays to the Gravitino. And that also means that if it's unstable, the next to, uh, next to lighter supersymmetric particle can actually be charged. The lifetime of this object is free, so it can run from microns to kilometers. So now you have new signatures. If it's microns, well, you have somebody who decays into the, uh, the early part of the detector and looks almost like a B decay or something like that. But the other limit, if it's something whose lifetime is like uh, tens of centimeters, like a, a, a lambda or a K short and so on, then you have a spectacular decay in with a secondary vertex inside the core of the detector. And then if it's kilometers, you basically have a very heavy, stable particle that actually traverses the detector. Now the first two is obvious that, that can be covered. The interesting one is what happens if you have a, uh, a charged, very heavy object, how would you actually see it at uh, the LHC? Well, it's basically a measurement of the time of flight, and uh, this is what you have here is one of the beta, which is uh, the, the speed of the particle as a function of the momentum, as you would measure it from the fact that it registers in the muon chambers. This guy presumably traverses the entire detector and gets to the muon chamber. There is actually a challenge to be able to see this thing that would come out of, say, Staus, as opposed to the muons. And the challenge is to make sure that the beautiful trigger that's been set up to synchronize itself on the 25 nanoseconds doesn't kill these events. Because you saw actually the concentric circles going of 25 nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds, 75 nanoseconds. So the whole timing of the detector has been conceived for particles that come from the interaction at the speed of light, essentially. Now what you have is somebody who's moving very slowly, one of a beta of two. So therefore, by definition, by the gut, by the time he breathlessly arrives to the muon chambers, actually the timing is looking against it. So for this type of thing, we'll have to have dedicated runs, which have specific gating on the timing in order to allow for this type of thing. <coughs> you need to set up basically a different. The reach is actually, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. You get the flavor for that. So what's a Susie summary? The discovery should be easy and fast. What that means is that we're going to have a very large yield of events with dielectron, diphoton, jets, and so on and so on. Uh, reconstructing back what it really is is going to be a different game. Squarks and gluinos can be discovered over a very large range in the, in the supra space, uh, corresponding up to about 2 TeV. The charginos and neutralinos actually depends on the model and where we actually are. And because this is a hadron machine, slaptons, you can see them up to about 300 GV, and at that point you give up. Because the only way we see those is in, in the cascades <coughs> as, the, as byproducts rather than direct production. And then what are the measurements? The mass differences from edges, spork and gluino masses from combinatorics by adding a jet and so on. And one could extract ultimately with the largest integrated luminosities of Susan parameters with a 1 to 10% accuracy. Let me show you an example of a precision SUSE measurement that one could make, depending, of course, on where one is. Now, this, has been, this point has been selected <coughs> because it's particularly favorable. Okay? So this is not the typical point. So this is, what is, this is in GMSB, point 1A, as it's called, or, 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 fine. And this is the decay chi 2 that goes into lepton slepton 
that goes into the chi 10 lepton lepton, and then the chi 10 decays finally to the lightest, the LSP, which, is, as we said, in gauge mediated symmetry breaking, is the gravitino and the photon. So, uh, hard cups, uh, mass effect of about 400 GV, missing ET greater than at least a tenth of that. Same flavor leptons, you make the mass distribution of the two leptons, EE e and mu mu, you subtract E mu, and you see the sharp edge. Boom. Um, alternatively, you could have a long-lived uh, chi-1. The edge is still there. So you start from that. Now, what does the edge give you? Well, it's the end point in mass of the two leptons, and therefore it depends on two parameters. It depends on the mass of the chi-2. This is mass lepton lepton. Mass of the chi-2, mass of the lepton, and mass of the chi-1. So you have three parameters now that you have to fight. And you measure one edge with very high precision because these are leptons. Now you go to events that have two leptons and two photons. In other words, you have both sides. And you plot the minimum combination lepton, lepton, photon, which is shown here. Now this correspondingly has a maximum value to which you can get to. Always the subtraction is there, the E mu and so on, which is now driven by the mass difference between the chi 2 and the chi 1. So now you have another relationship. And then finally, you need to narrow down on the mass lepton-photon combination because remember, the final decay is the fact that this lepton has given you the chi-1 and the lepton. So what you do there, you take the events where um, you, uh, you have the events where only one of the two combinations, you have two combinations, lepton-lepton-photon-1, lepton-lepton-photon-2. You take the events where only one of the combinations is below the edge. Then by definition, there's no doubt as to which one is a correct photon. The one which is above the edge is by definition cannot come from that same decay. So therefore now you have unambiguously identified the decay chain. You lose statistics in so doing, but now you know who the guy is. And now you plot the mass of the lepton and photon, and what you have is a, a, a Curie plot, if you want, near the end, uh, corresponding to the end here, plus the edge that comes out of the left and the photon. Here's two more relationships that, again, you can measure with very high precision. And at this point, you have basically reconstructed everything. It's actually a very accurate reconstruction of all the masses involved. You can get a, at low luminosity to a precision of half a GeV. Now, this is a dream scenario. Okay, As I said, this is not a typical one. But you can actually extract all the masses. And the systematics that would be uh, involved in this would be just a normal lepton measurement systematics. Then you could even uh, uh, reconstruct the uh, gravitino momentum by making a zero C fit onto the, uh, the, the full decay. Then, if you really have all these masses, you add the, the jets, and you get the mass of the sport and the gluino as well, by adding two jets and three jets. The peaks are, of course, very, very, very broad. <coughs> voilà. So, there are some parts of SUSY where one is, if one is lucky, one can actually perform accurate measurements of the actual parameters. Okay, enough for SUSY, uh, turning to uh, other uh, physics beyond the standard model. This being a, a, a high energy machine, obviously, you look for compositeness, the way you do it is with the usual uh, angular distribution, the 1 plus cosine theta star, 1 minus cosine theta star. Um, if if all you had is something like Rutherford scattering, this would be a distribution which is flat, as you know, the sigma d chi. And these are ET distributions out of Atlas, for example. This is a deviation as a function of ET. And if you have um, compositeness at some scale lambda, what happens is that you deviate and, and then you start taking off. You might remember some signal that looked like this a few years ago out of the Cavatron and, and gluon structure functions and so on where it looked at again. So the ultimate reach with the highest luminosities is something like uh, a 40 TeV. What you have here actually is uh, the reach with 300 inverse atomers at 14 TeV and perhaps a super LHC at 28 TeV. More on this in a second. And of course, you can look for excited quarks, which would be a jet plus photon combination. You'd be looking for resonances on top of a steeply falling background, and there is a reach which correspondingly is always uh, at the level of 5 to 6 TeV. But the name of the game these days, and the, like, the excitement, is actually out of TeV scale gravity. 
where, remember, that Susie is, is basically uh, put forth as the ultimate mass protector of the Higgs because it, of, of the masses in general, because with Susie, the loop corrections are basically proportional to the mass difference squared between the super partner and the partner because of the loops. The pro-LHC argument is that if you want to keep this small, you better keep this guy here up to about the TV. And the positive side effects that you get a free dark matter candidate, uh, you make unification easier because you know that there's a kink in the running of the three coupling constants. And of course, there's a poetic justice which is why should the symmetry not appear in nature? But what Susie doesn't give us is why these two numbers are so different from each other. At best, it allows it, but it says nothing as to the how or the why. Now, what is the great idea of our times? The great idea of our times is basically that here are the three coupling constants shrunk now because the scale has completely changed. This is mz, m gut, m uh, string, if you want. And these are the three which are running and they meet together somewhere at the gut scale. And this red curve is, is the E squared over M Planck squared of the gravitational coupling running. And of course, it just runs like a rock, which is why by the time it gets to the mundane world that we live in, it's 42 orders of magnitude weaker. So this has a very steep running and it's the result of M Planck squared. So what Roughly the idea of our times is, is that, okay, we know that strings are supposed to live in more than four dimensions, and the compactification brings us down to the four-dimensional world that we live in. And therefore, if these extra dimensions have some kind of mass scale, or correspondingly a volume that corresponds to them, then the four-dimensional Planck mass squared is basically that volume times the corresponding Planck scale in these extra dimensions. This is just a, a, a dimensional equation and nothing more. Conventional compactification then comes in and says these dimensions are very, very tiny, and therefore this volume is very, very tiny, and as a result, this number here is very large. So the trick is, you say, the alternative then to this is that actually the volume over which the dimensions have been compactified is actually very large instead. Large enough that this volume is much larger than the corresponding four-dimensional equivalent of the Planck scale, then this thing can be down to a TV. Nothing prevents you from that. Thus the name of TV scale gravity. Now there's two ways of achieving this large volume. One, you just make it large by hand. The other one is you have a, a warp factor. By hand is the model of Arkani Hamed, Dimopoulos and, and, and Vali, whereby they say, Suppose there were micro and extra dimensions, who would know about it? The answer is nobody, so therefore we cannot exclude them. So the idea is that uh, we have our brain, as they call it in string theory. I try to read exactly what it is, I just know that it corresponds to the place where the uh, you know, strings begin and end, but no more than that. And then in the other, outside the brain is where gravi gravity propagates. What you do is you curl this up, and therefore, you end up with this part I do understand, the kaluza klein excitations that run once, twice, three times, and so on through the circle in the normal compactification. In this scenario, when you run, here is three, two, one, and here is, again, the, the energy scale, and you come in from the, uh, from the E squared evolution of gravity, you go, 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 and you think that they would meet here. But the moment you hit, one over R, whereby you start propagating here, in other words, in the extra dimension, obviously, the rate of the running changes. And you turn around and you have the very exciting possibility that actually this is a mirage. And you don't have a 10 to the 16 scale to worry about and to answer why it's so different from the weak scale. Fundamentally, actually, the moment you start running faster, you meet the two scales much closer to each other. So naturalness disappears. It's no longer an issue. So this is what the extra dimension has bought you, and of course with it, it brings the extra particles, the extra resonances that run around in the circle. The other possibility is the so-called warp factor. What happens here is that you say, I'm going to write down from my old days of general relativity, the most general ds squared here, and here are my old four dimensions, and since there are many more, I will just write them as another metric here, gmn, with the y being the extra dimensions, however many of them they are. So y is the extra ones. Now, if you look at this equation and you assume that, again, you live in one of these, there's nothing that holds you back to say, actually, here, 
I have a number which is a constant if you live on this plane, but it's a function of the extra dimension. So you introduce an e to the a y, and this is called the warp factor. Because what it means is that you are here. The metric that you see, it depends on an extra dimension of which you have no idea that it exists, and therefore you just have your usual four-dimensional general relativity metric, so to speak, except that now, this being a function of, of, of the extra dimension, if you have two of them, and we are actually here, and this is, say, the Planck brain, this distance could be very small, but because there is an exponential difference between the two, you actually acquire orders of magnitude of different scale between this guy and this.